evening um, and welcome to the Monday, August 24th Board of Education meeting for the East China School District. I apologize, we are experiencing some technical difficulties. Um, our live stream is not currently working. However, the meeting is being recorded and it will be available for viewing um, following the end of the meeting. So at this time, if everyone would please stand for a moment of silence and a pledge of allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, I have a, a couple of um, things to go over before we jump into this evening's meeting. Um, I just want to make a note that due to the governor's um, July 29th executive order 160, she specifically prohibits traditional in-person school board meetings in all eight regions of the state. So that is why we are again meeting virtually. Um, we also need to make a couple of amendments to the agenda and so I will need um, a motion. The first amend amendment will be an addition, um, which will make this an addition of 6A, an action item for an extension agreement with ECEA MEA. So this will align other groups. Um, the ECEA had to ratify with their members before we could add it to our board agenda. So that's why it wasn't on the board um, agenda until till we're amending it today. So that's why you didn't see it on there previously. So a motion is needed for that, please. So moved. So moved. Support. Okay, are there any comments or questions regarding that? Okay, so item 6A now will read um, extension agreement ECEA slash MEA. The second edition will be item 6B, another action item. That's our school schedules. And again, we couldn't add that to the agenda until um, the administration was able to meet with the ECEA, which they did towards the end of last week. Um, and they were able to reach an agreement. So now we can put that onto our, our formal agenda. So that would be item 6B. Um, motion is needed for that, please. So moved. Support. Any comments or questions? Okay, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Okay, so that motion carries. Did I not ask for a vote on the previous? No. I didn't, okay, so I apologize. Um, can we back up and there were no discussion discussions on item 6A. We did have a motion and a second. So everyone in favor of adding that to the agenda, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, opposing sign. Okay, that motion also carries, sorry about that. Okay, so that takes care of all the extras and now we can jump into the meeting. Um, items of interest, recognition and inquiry, Board of Education members, does anybody have anything this evening? I, I have one thing. Okay. I'd just like to thank everyone who sent an email to the board about returning to school. Um, there were probably more letters about this than both bonds combined. Um, I read every letter and took your questions and suggestions seriously. Um, you may have recognized the questions at the last meeting. Um, that being said, at the end of the day, a decision has to be made. And whether you agree with that decision, please know that the safety of the students, their families, and the East China staff were my number one concern. And I believe that's true of every board member here. But I just want to thank everybody who wrote in to us. Absolutely. Thank you, Karen. Anybody else? OK, I'd also just like to um, you know, reiterate that I'm very proud to be part of the East China School District and our fierce dedication to always put our students' needs first. 
and to thank everyone for their hard work and all the additional work that it took in order to implement all of the necessary safety protocols so that we are able to offer um, two great options for our families. So thank you, everyone. Mrs. Saibula. Yes, good evening. Um, I just want to, again, um, as I did on the 10th, continue to thank the East China School District staff and everyone who is working so very hard um, to get us ready for our students on September 8th. So many new things to do and so many um, traditional things to do, but there's a lot on everyone's plate and I know it's a difficult time and I appreciate everyone's hard work um, getting us ready for our students on September 8th. So thank you. Okay, so the next item on our agenda is our consent agenda. Um, and a motion is needed for the approval of the minutes, and I need to make a note that um, the, the Special Board of Education meeting August 10, 2020, there will be an amendment um, to the minutes on page set six. It just has President James Bewer as the board president. That will be corrected to reflect my name, Jeannie Frank. So um, a motion is needed to approve those minutes regular board of ed meeting on July 27th, the special board meeting on August um, August 10th, approval of the payment of bills, schedule of investments, and the appointment of new teachers. So moved. Support. Any comments or questions? Okay, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, that motion carries. Um, now we'll move on to item number four in our agenda, and that's recognition of persons wishing to address the board. This portion of the agenda is for citizens to address any questions or comments to the board. The board will listen, take comments and questions under advisement, but we will not be able to respond at this time. Um, so this evening we have four in, call, four in callers, and um, I believe 11 or 12 letters that were sent in. So we'll begin with the callers. Um, you'll, you'll be notified, um, Mr. Headley will notify you, and at that time, I think this, this signal, the, the key was to hit star six on your phone to unmute yourselves. Um, at that time, please state your name, your address, and if you could please limit your remarks to five minutes. So the first caller I have is Terry Mullane. Terry, hopefully you can hear us and you can hit star six and begin. Can you hear me, Jeannie? Yes, good, yes, good evening. Hi, Terry. Good evening. Um, this is Terry Mullane, president of the East China Education Association, um, 669 West Court, St. Clair. Um, good evening, President Frank, members of the board, Superintendent Sabula. I first want to thank you for your continued efforts to seek the best return to school solution for our community students and the East China Educate, um, East China School District staff. Um, as I mentioned at the last board meeting, the East China Education Association is dedicated to working with administration to find solutions that meet the educational needs of our students and also ensure the safety of our students and staff alike. Until you start working on the details, it's hard to imagine the extreme logistics um, in providing both online and face-to-face -face instruction. The teaching staff is taking on a whole new role teaching virtually in addition to the traditional face-to-face -face role. We felt it was important to develop a schedule to provide the parents um, to assist them in the difficult decision-making process. However, as we were making this schedule, we had no way of knowing how many students would be in each face-to-face -face class or section. These class numbers are critical to safety. Our position remains as it has from the beginning that appropriate social distancing must be maintained to ensure the safety of our students and our staff. If class, if class numbers do not allow for such, um, we will need to make adjustments. And in these unprecedented times, we realize that the plans will continue to evolve. To this end, I ask that we have the full support of the board as we engage in continuing negotiations to ensure proper safety measures, which includes social distancing. Um, and um, to that end, I just want to thank you for that and hope that we have your support in that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next caller is Stephanie Goodell. Stephanie, are you here? I'm here. Can you hear me? We can. Yep, I can hear you. Hi. 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 Um, 
So I know that the school board administrators and teachers have had very had had to make very challenging decisions recently. I know everyone is struggling to make reasonable choices for all involved, but I want to remind everyone tonight about the children with special needs and how important face-to-face -face learning is for them. This not only includes those with cognitive impairments, but all students that struggle learning or need something like speech therapy or occupational therapy. In my opinion, any student in one of these groups I just mentioned is going to struggle with virtual learning. How does a parent who is not trained speech, uh, perform speech therapy or occupational therapy with their child? These are highly specialized fields and basically impossible to do unless you are face to face with the child. Regardless of the risk, parents with kids with special needs require that face to face interaction in not just a few days a week, but every day. An inconsistent schedule of some, some days in class and some days out doing virtual work does not work well with kids with special needs. They and all kids need consistency to thrive. And this as a side note, as a, as a child that has someone that has a child with um, learning struggles and special needs, I've been trying to find an alternative to public schooling and it's difficult for those of us because not all private schools can take on those kids. So our only choice Sometimes we're ending up between a rock and a hard place because our students are basically going to get left behind with virtual learning. To summarize, I urge you to remember that your decisions affect a wide variety of people in a wide variety of situations. And it is imperative that families are able to choose what is best for their situation. Um, I think I forgot to say my address. It's 1975 Woodland Estates Drive in St. Clair. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, um, Lane Siplik. Lane, are you there? Yeah, hi, good evening. Hi, good evening. Hi. Thank you for taking um, our comments. Uh, my name is Lane Siplik and I live at 1681 North Delano Street. Um, I just really wanted to bring forward um, the importance that I felt um, needs to continue and I can appreciate all the efforts that have been put in by all the appropriate parties to make uh, all of the decisions that go into what this school year is gonna look like. And really the long and short of it is, I just urge the board to still consider giving um, us as parents the option to send our kids face to face. Um, I know this is um, difficult and I know that, um, you know, safety is a, is a very, um, important piece of this decision. And I, um, I respect that I'm with that. Um, but I think that the importance of having um, our students offered a face to face option, um, I really I, I beg and plead of you to still be an option um, for those of us parents to choose that for our children. Um, I have three kids in the district, one that's going to be in sixth grade, one who is a um, fourth grader and the CI program, and one that's starting kindergarten. And to be very honest, I, I am very concerned about not having a face-to-face -face option for my kindergartner. Um, so I, I just, I, I beg and plead that that is something that is considered when making these decisions that we as parents still have the option to be able to send our kids face-to-face. -face. Thank you. Thank you, Lane. Um, Robert Luther. Can Robert? you guys hear me? Yes. Hello. Hi. How are you? How's everybody doing? Good. How are um, you? Good. Good. Thank you for allowing me to call in. Uh, my name is Robert. Sir. I live at 641 St. Andrews in St. Clair, Michigan. Um, so I'm going to sound like a bit of a broken record, I think, considering the, the comments that came before me. However, I want to start off by saying um, I commend all of you for the tremendous amount of work that you've had to take on. So this, this year was probably not in your job description when you decided to become a board member at East China School District. So there's a lot of us parents and a lot of us community members who don't take to the social media airways to, to share our grievances um, like some. And I want to make sure that from the silent majority of us that don't do that, that you understand we we do care for the decisions that you have to make about our kids. And these are very, very hard decisions during very, very hard times. Having said all of that, one of the reasons why I feel like people move to our community is because of how great our school system is. And I'll forever believe that. 
as a parent who's dedicated quite a bit of my free time to supporting the East China School District, I've seen firsthand um, the great work that our teachers do for our kids. And I understand that sometimes when your hands are being forced to do things a certain way, I trust that the decision-making power of this group will exhaust all of the options to allow us parents to continue to have the right to choose what we feel is best for our kids. Because at the end of the day, our kids are the future leaders of this great community that we live in and that we, that we love so much. So I, I say all of that to say I hope that you, know, you exhaust every option possible to ensure that our, the community has a voice and that we can choose what's best, whether that's in person or virtual. I just hope that you know, we, we have the opportunity to do that. That's all I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we'll, um, we'll start with our letters. The first letter is from Lynn Eitner. Dear board members, there has been a lot of talk lately of choices, offering choices, making choices, and how the choices you make can have a profound effect on your life or a few of the topics being talked about in the return to the learn debate. Normally I would say that giving people choices is a good idea, but as you know, there is nothing normal about this choice. You see, I'm an ECSD educator. Giving parents a choice essentially takes my choice away. I don't have a choice to return to the classroom or not. I'm the primary provider and insurer for my three kids. I don't have a choice to keep my family safe or not. I don't have a choice as to how many kids I have in my classroom or whether or not I can space them six feet apart as recommended. I don't have a choice about where my students go when they're not in school. I don't have a choice as to whether or not a student or staff member will get sick or worse. Schools have the choice. They can choose to put staff and students at risk by starting face-to-face, -face, or they can choose to make the decision to put safety first by postponing the beginning of the school year. Doing the unpopular thing is often the toughest decision, and I don't envy your position. You may have heard from some of my colleagues that want to return to school fully. I envy their peace of mind. I have fretted over this situation all summer. While I have a different opinion than them, it doesn't make me a bad teacher. It doesn't mean I am on the wrong side of this argument, and it certainly doesn't mean that I love my students any less. It just means that if we're giving people choices, I choose the health and safety of my students, my family, and my colleagues over convenience. Thank you. Sincerely, Lynn Eitner. Kim Everhart, dear, or excuse me, Kim Everhart, East China Board of Education. I was hired by ECSD in August of 1987. Although not from this area, I have lived here longer than years I spent growing up in my hometown. Over the past 33 years, I have experienced joy in working with the majority of citizens currently living within the area. I feel like family. I've never participated or under understood the North-South rivalry in the district. To me, it's always been one community working for the kids Beyond my regular school year gig, I also teach summer school for both sides of the district and enjoy the opportunity to expand my student base. I have been vocal regarding our return to buildings in September. My professional experience tells me there are going to be many hiccups as we return face to face. It is this trial and error while already taking the risk of returning during a pandemic, which I find troubling. Our students should not be guinea pigs knowing we are going to make mistakes it would be best to have those mistakes happen in a remote learning environment over a face-to-face -face COVID exposure snafu. Participating in behavior that may potentially harm my students and those they love without speaking my concern is not my style. We teach our students to speak out and ask questions. Why would we behave any differently or shame others for searching and seeking answers? This decision should not be political. It should not be emotional. It should not be about the economy or about child care for parents who need to work. It should be based on the safest way to continue educating the youth in this community. I cannot speak for elementary teachers, but I can state as a regular education secondary educator, we are able to provide our students a safe and quality online education during this pandemic. We are professionals. Given the reins to do the job we were trained to do, we can provide an engaging experience for our students. We know how to create quality lessons and small group online experiences, making remote learning more hands-on than a mass face-to-face -face experience while attempting physical distance in a poorly ventilated classroom. <clears throat> Excuse me. We can rise to the occasion and make this a positive experience in a horrible situation. March was not an example of what remote learning would or should be. It was the nation, state, and district trying to figure out the logistics of 
equality for all a moment's notice. Districts have had since March to organize and prepare for remote learning. It's the safest back to school option. It might not be a favorite for those who miss being together, but that's what a pandemic mandates. We're not supposed to be socializing in person or large groups. Why are we testing the waters with our children? Why are adults who will not walk in educators or student shoes voting to send teachers and students into buildings without the certified guarantee of safety? You as a school board must provide the safest way to continue education. Please don't take risks with other human lives. Sincerely, KK Everhart. Um, D. Pat Salas, I cannot express how important it is that our children and our parents have the right to choose what type of learning they would like to participate in. My children desperately want to go back to school. They need to be engaged with their teachers, with their peers. This is not just about learning. This is about a child's mental and social stability. We have spent months participating in sports events in and out of state. They found summer camps all in an effort to overcome the emotional and social isolation they've endured since March. This can be done, and it can be done safely. If a parent or student does not feel comfortable, then they can make their choice to stay home. But as for me and my family, we want the choice to go back face to face. We understand the risks to their health and safety to go back in person, and we understand the risks to their mental health if they have to stay home. We choose mental well-being, social interaction with peers, and face-to-face -face learning with our dedicated teachers. It should be a choice. Carrie Frederall Estapa, the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control have established that the coronavirus is highly contagious and is spread via by aerosols and droplets. The virus can hang in the air for over three hours. The viral load also builds up over time, especially with a super spreader. There are multiple studies on airflow and viral spread in enclosed, crowded, closed contact spaces. There have been many cases of spread in the news such as the spread in the East Lansing Bar, which ballooned to 185 cases, and the two-and-a-half-hour choir practice, where one person spread the virus to 52 other people. Is it in the interest of the East China School District to return our children to school safely? Has the district done any research on management of airflow, ventilation, and purification of air for our classrooms? When was the last time the ventilation systems were updated and cleaned? Epifiltration is the only filter that has the ability to capture particles as small as a virus. The WHO and CDC warn that COVID-19 spreads more easily under the following conditions. Crowded places with many people nearby, close contact settings, especially where people have close range conversations, confined and enclosed closed spaces with poor ventilation. The risk is higher in places where these factors overlap. Even as restrictions are lifted, the three C should still be avoided. These conditions are the description of a school classroom. If the ECSD's decision is to return students face-to-face -face instruction, then it's worth investing in procedures and infrastructure that will keep our children and staff safe. I recommend that ECSD return to school if and when real measures are taken to ensure the safety of all staff and students. If more time is needed to make this happen, then an online format would be appropriate until the district is ready. Thank you, Carrie Frederall and Stafa. Okay, five, Susan Day. Dear East China School District Board of Education, I am writing to ensure that our back to school plan for the East China School District is rooted in safety. We all want to get back to the classroom, but only if it can be done safely by following the required guidelines as specified by the Michigan Safe Schools, Michigan's 2020-21 Return to School Roadmap. I would like to bring your attention to page 27 and 28 of this document where it clearly states the cleaning requirements. I still have concerns regarding the following questions. Do we have enough PPE for all students and staff? Please note that as required in phase four for the Michigan Roadmap on page 27, staff must wear gloves, surgical masks, and face shield when performing all cleaning activities. What is the cost of the additional cleaning staff and cleaning supplies required to provide the cleaning? Has additional staff been hired as of date? It was stated in the board meeting on August 10th that students would be wiping down their own desks between class periods. This is a direct conflict to the cleaning requirements as listed on page 27 of the Michigan Back to School Roadmap. Ensure safe and correct use and storage of cleaning and disinfection products, including storing products securely away from children and with adequate ventilation with staff use products. Staff must wear gloves, surgical masks, and face shield when performing all cleaning activities. 
The CDC also has documentation which states cleaning and disinfection products should not be used by or near students and both their six steps for properly cleaning and disinfecting your school and their cleaning and disinfecting in school classroom documents that are to be used as guidelines for school to reopen safely. Um, she lists here a couple of um, links from the CDC and the coronavirus. Um, those um, will be, all the board members will get a copy of this. Um, how is our cleaning staff, staff going to be able to clean and disinfect all the needed spaces per the roadmap? Frequently touched services, including light switches, doors, benches, bathrooms, must undergo cleaning at least every four hours with either an EPA approved disinfected or diluted leach solution. Libraries, computer labs, arts, and other hands on classrooms must undergo cleaning. After every class period with either an EPA approved disinfected or diluted bleach solution. Student desks must be wiped down with either an EPA approved disinfected or diluted bleach solution after every class period. How will bathrooms be handled clean? We have one bathroom with three stalls per gender for 10 classrooms at my school. If teachers need to quarantine, how does this impact their sick days? Will quarantine teachers still need to teach virtually? How is our district addressing the sub shortage? How many school nurses does our district have and are they part-time or full-time? Will they be handling all the COVID-19 related issues on top of their current responsibilities? My final question is if we do not have clear and definitive answers to these questions, how can we start school in person? I truly believe that we are all part of the same team working together to ensure that safety is of the utmost importance during the COVID-19 pandemic. I assume positive intent here. I trust that everyone is working hard trying to meet the requirements. Yet yeah, this is not an easy task and it requires considerable review by many to be sure all of our bases are covered. The stakes are too high not to get this right. Thank you for your time. Sincerely, Susan Day. Okay, Nina Resnick to President Jeannie Frank and members of the board. As we try and navigate through these unprecedented times, I would be remiss not to provide my input based on over 30 years of experience working with at-risk students most of those years. Currently, as the state and federal grant coordinator for the East China School District, I gather data and feedback from the various grant-funded initiatives we have throughout the district, many that target ASPRIS students. This includes additional instruction time for K-3 students, credit recovery, alternative education, summer school, and some interventions throughout the school year. Funding through 31A requires we identify students who meet one of nine criteria the state recognizes as at-risk. Most prevalent of those are economically disadvantaged, absences of 10% or more and not achieving proficiency either on state or local assessments on ELA or mathematics. We also arrange support or additional learning time for reading at the K-3 level to provide those students who need extra support the opportunity to move towards proficiency. It is not a secret to any of us in education that the, well, excuse me, the most important influence on children's academic performance is based on a classroom teacher. Recently, due, the pan, due to the pandemic, we had to go virtual in our district, as you know. When I reached out for feedback from teachers who were working with our most struggling students, it was apparent that online was not a good option to fill the learning gaps. Just a little feedback. We had credit recovery summer school that was all virtual. 48% of the students recovered credit, but 52% did not. I am still waiting for elementary summer school feedback. My biggest concern is the continued gaps in learning that will get worse if we keep students out of the classroom. At this time, we have 37% of our student population that is economically disadvantaged. On top of that, we have another 34% who have additional at-risk factors, such as not being proficient on local and state assessments. Our, our alternative education program will be, dis, be devastated if the only option is online. The numbers will only get worse without our students back in the classroom with their teachers. Based on an article in the New York Times, the average student could begin the next school year having lost as much as a third of the expected progress from the previous year in reading and half of the expected progress in math, according to a working paper from NWEA. They also did analysis of students utilizing an online math program before and after schools closed in March. It found that through late April, student progress in math decreased 
by about half for low income students, a third by middle income, and not at all for high income students. Basically, students who do well will do well in most circumstances, but middle and struggling students will see substantial academic loss. I am concerned about what it means not only about the academic success of our students, but the social and emotional toll taken on them by not being in school. Schools provide a stable and secure environment for de developing social skills and relationships. According to the CDC, extended school closures are harmful to children's development of social and emotional skills and their mental health. For all these reasons stated above, I am advocating for our return to school plan, which has safety protocols in place for students and staff. Again, we are working through unprecedented times, but at this time we need to move forward, not backwards. We have a board approved plan in place and have communicated that to our community. Our parents who have been given online options as well are looking forward to the new school year opening in person safely with the understanding that if things change, we will be prepared for those changes. Thank you, Nina Resnick, State and Federal Grant Coordinator. Jody Rendell, the decision to change the start and end time of the fifth grade students to be the same of the elementary schools has put a huge burden on parents. Getting the kids back and forth to school was at least one less worry that parents didn't have. However, now it is a problem. I completely understand the need to have less kids in the hallways, but a two hour difference doesn't make sense. Obviously, I don't know who made the decision, but whomever did did not think of the parents. If this decision was to force more parents into choosing virtual versus face-to-face, -face, please stop. Just choose one or the other. Making the decision was hard enough, and now I have to decide which kid is going to be late every day. I really hope the board and teachers union reconsider this decision. Brianne Disselrapp. Thank you again to our board superintendent, administrators, and most of all, our incredible teachers that have been working so hard these last two weeks to give our most precious of gifts, our children, the option to have face-to-face -face learning for the start of the 2020-21 school year. For weeks, we as parents have been given two choices, choices that most likely will have an option that will work for your family. Our daughter is ecstatic to be a fifth grader at St. Clair Middle School, not a fifth grader at Disselrath Middle School. I have worked in the medical field for over 15 years after changing my major from education. In my years in the medical field, I never once contracted any communicable disease my husband has worked right in the hot zone, Detroit, through this pandemic and has not contracted COVID, nor have any of his fellow co-workers. Our teachers and staff are now our much needed essential workers who need to give face-to-face -face interaction on a daily basis with our students. Not a few days a week, but five days to develop those connections and relationships that are so important to our children as they grow academically, mentally, and emotionally. Like all things in life, there are choices. The ECSD community has this board to make the choices needed. I ask the board to be the voice of having a choice in our children's education. When you have outstanding ECSD teachers wanting full-time face-to-face to remain available, keep that in mind when hearing what the East China Education Association is recommending to the contrary. Please continue to offer the choices as they stand, five days face-to-face -face or virtual. Thank you, Brianne Disarab, fifth grade parent. Chris McDonald, we need to have the option of face-to-face. -face. In my home, both parents work and there is no one to make sure my child stays on task. If more stay home, good for them. It limits numbers in classes. Some kids just don't need that face-to-face -to, -face to learn. I know that masks are a higher issue, but maybe there will be more flexibility in classrooms if less kids. Christy Kleeman. First, I would like to thank the superintendent, the committees working to come up with plans for our children to return safely to school and each of the board members. Your dedication to our children, their education and the safety of our community is noticed and appreciated. As a parent of a fourth grader at Gearing and a freshman at St. Clair High School this year, I again ask that you continue forward with the current educational choices of virtual or face-to-face -face learning. Please allow the families of the district to do what they feel is going to allow their children to thrive and academically succeed. Please allow the families a choice that will allow their family to thrive, not just survive. Now having a better grasp of the proposed virtual learning plan for the district, I am confident in saying that it would not be ideal for my children. <clears throat> Excuse me. They need face-to-face -face instruction 
pressure from peers to succeed, and interaction, even if it's from a distance, with other children. They need structure that is only going to be possible in a live classroom. I trust the safety plans the district has in place and hope to see them carried out starting on September 8th. Thank you. Mina Terrell. In addition to being an educator for 16 years, I have two students in the East China School District, a seventh grade student at St. Clair Middle School and a fourth grade student at Gearing Elementary. My husband and I decided that the best option for our children was to return to school in person. This was not a decision that we made lightly. Our decision has nothing to do with the fact that we both work and that it's more convenient that our boys are in school. Our decision has everything to do with the fact that the best learning environment for our children is in the classroom with their peers, learning from the incredible teachers in the East China School District. My children are eager to return to school. They are prepared to uphold the necessary safety precautions. They are both prepared to wear a mask because they understand it keeps other people safe. They are, prepared for how, they are prepared for how things will look different, and they are still excited to go back to school. I want to thank the board, the administration, the teachers, and every other ECSC employee for all of their work, hard work, and to help us return to school safely. We are very thankful for the opportunity to choose what school will look like this year. There will never be a one-size-fits-all solution. Please do not take away our option to choose what is best for our children. Thank you. Lauren Martin. Okay, Lauren Martin, this is the last one. As a parent in this community, I'd like to express my wishes for the upcoming school year. I would like our district to continue to offer face-to-face -face learning. It's one of the most important aspects of many families, and it's been gone for far too long. Our society has been structured around children being in school for eight hours a day, for longer than any of us have been alive. People can't just quit their jobs to stay home and facilitate school. People can't just quit their jobs to stay home to care for their children during the day. And it's certainly not fair to ask working families who will need child care, such as daycare, to keep their jobs to then go home and implement a six-hour school day every night. Even if parents are fortunate enough to work from home, I would imagine their employers would still expect them to work during the day, therefore not having the ability to facilitate a school program. We have a fairly large family, five kids two of which are still in diapers. I promise you, my home is not the best option for a learning environment for my older children. To be honest, I'm not cut out for teaching. My older kids need and deserve better than what I can give them. Our kids belong in school. There are many other essential employees in this country, including healthcare workers, gas station and grocery store employees, etc. They've all managed to keep things moving forward despite the daily circumstances we're faced with. I feel that teachers are just as essential as first responders, daycare providers, and elected officials such as yourselves. Schooling can't just go away, and taking the choice of an in-person learning shouldn't just go away either. We have reached the point where kids need to go back to school. They need structure. They need socialization. This isn't just about who may or may not want to go back to work. This is about our kids and what they need. And face-to-face -face learning is exactly that. So is giving families some stability and normalcy. There are hundreds of families in this district, all with different circumstances. I think it speaks volumes that 75% of our families have already said they want to have face-to-face -face learning. Does that not count for anything? A majority of your school district has expressed the need and desire for face-to-face -face learning. I think we should be listening to that. I commend ECSD for still offering face-to-face -face learning, especially when so many districts have already done away with it. I will be greatly disappointed in our district and the board members if they take this option away from our families of this district. There's been countless studies proven that face-to-face -face learning and small group interactions are the most effective and positive way to learn. It's time our district and our board members stand up and start advocating for what's best for our children. I don't envy anyone having to make these decisions, but at the end of the day, I still feel parents' input is important and should be valued by our district, our administration, and our board members. Okay, I'd just like to thank everybody who called in this evening and um, who also sent in their letters. We all appreciate your input. So now we will move on to item number five of our agenda discussion items, and that's um, our return to school update, Mrs. Saimula. Mrs. Sibula, you're still on mute. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Frank and members of the board. Um, I'd like to take this time to update everyone on our planning since we last met on August 10th on our return to learn. So when we last met on August 10th at our special board meeting, the legislature still hadn't made their decisions yet on the return to learn legislation and bills. Since then, they have. The return to learn legislation was signed by the governor last um, Thursday. And the highlights of that legislation include uh, pupil accounting, how we'll be counting our students, our FTEs. It'll be, it's a, not as clean cut as this, but 75% will be from our count last year and 25% will be from our count this year, which allows for some stability in the FTE funding. The days and clock hours, that, that was the number one thing that we were looking for some flexibility with that has been waived. Um, although it, they put a lot of requirements in place for those requirements to be waived. Attendance, that was another um, um, subject that we needed clarification on, and it has been clarified in this legislation as a two-way interaction between the teacher and the student. We'll, with this legislation, we'll be required to give two benchmark assessments, um, one within the first nine weeks of school and one towards the end of school. There are five um, approved uh, assessments, one of them being NWEA, and we will use NWEA as that is the one that we have used in the past, and it needs to be one that you have used in previous years. There needs to be a continuity of learning plan with goals decided by the district by September 15th, and then a continuity of learning plan approved by October 1st and submitted to our RISA. This is an extended continuity of learning plan, similar to the one that we had to do in March, but with much more stringent guidelines as to um, the learning. The local health department was reaffirmed as the um, maintenance of metrics for the county and ones that we'll rely on for our information and the um, investigations of COVID uh, cases. And then finally, with this legislation, the kindergarten readiness assessment has been eliminated uh, because of lack of funding. So also on um, August 10th, when we met last, we had a lot of um, discussion around schedules. And I, when we talked about we needed the legislation in order for those schedules to be discussed. And the Board of Education asked that the um, East China Administration meet with our ECEA uh, representatives to work on school schedules. We did that last Thursday and Friday and have tentatively agreed to move forward with the schedules that were presented at the August 10th Board of Education meeting with a few adjustments. The schedules um, for both secondary and elementary contain additional time at the end of the day, of each day for teachers to collaborate um, and work together and connect with their virtual students for the secondary teachers. The ELA schedule will contain or uh, have 30 um, additional minutes with them dismissing, with those schools dismissing at 3 p.m. Then that 30 minutes will be used for their collaboration time. The secondary teachers will dismiss, um, or the schools will dismiss at 12.40. And they will have 120 minutes to um, collaborate, work together, and create um, lessons and connect with their virtual students. These schedules, along with um, a lot of other information on our return to school plans, are located on our East China website. That we have changed the front page of the website and all of the buttons for the return to learn plan, including these schedules, are located there. I'd like to focus um, just a little bit on that 612 secondary schedule that was presented at the last board meeting and highlight um, some of the um, pieces of this modified schedule that are beneficial to where we are now in this uh, COVID planning. So the schedule, if you remember, it had um, three hours a day, first, second, and third on Monday, fourth, fifth, and sixth on Tuesday. And then we rotate that schedule for two weeks until every class has met an equal number of times. A schedule um, that, that we showed on August 10th and that we're, we're talking about now has some um, pieces of it that are really beneficial to the goals that we're trying to reach during this, this planning. It reduces the number of classes 
then points and therefore reducing the points of contact for students and teachers each day. It reduces the number of times that students are in the hallways and it um, provides for five hours and 10 minutes of class time each day for students. And again, reminder that the time that was uh, agreed upon with the ECEA at the end of each day allows for that, that time to work together, collaborate, develop lessons, and connect with those virtual students in those two-way communications that are now required, that we know are required in the legislation. Also, in our conversations with ECEA, we talked about a calendar. And we, we talked about a calendar for September because with our fluid situation, planning any further out, um, we thought it would be best to do some short-term planning uh, so that we could get this school year off a, on the best foot possible. And one of the, the pieces of this calendar, this first week of school, all those uh, four days, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday will be half days for students. And what this allows us to do, it, it will allow us to get a better hold on the number of face-to-face -face students that will be returning to our classrooms. Now, we, we have our numbers, but we may have some students that have selected other options um, since March or may have moved or we haven't received records requests for. So those first four days will allow us to really get a good grasp of what our face-to-face -face student number will be. It will also let us test our new procedures. So with this soft opening of, of having half days, we'll be able to run through our arrival uh, procedures, our dismissal procedures, our hallway procedures, our bathroom break procedures, and kind of um, get a handle on where we need to make adjustments and where things are really working. It will also allow these half days, um, the first four days, will allow for our staffs to meet immediately following the student's dismissal to talk about what's working, what isn't working, what procedures we need to tighten up, and maybe where we need to make some adjustments. So this, this calendar um, that, again, is on the website, it's a September 2020 calendar, um, just highlights the events that will happen in those, those, those first uh, month of school but I wanted to talk a lot about or give some definition to why those half days were discussed and why they think they're important for us to get off to a good start um, for the 2020 school year. So those were our discussions regarding schedules and calendar as um, in our August 10th meeting, it was requested that, I, that we meet with our ECEA representatives and talk about how best to come back to school. And that's what we, we did and tentatively agree to as we watch the numbers um, with those schedules. And at this time, I'm going to request that Assistant Superintendent Don Demick will provide an update on the personnel department as well as the online survey. Good evening, President Frank and board members of the board. Uh, on August 3rd, as you know, an online commitment and transportation survey was emailed to all of our families through Skyward. The survey provided two learning options for our families, the in-person or face-to-face -face instruction and the virtual or online option. The deadline to respond was extended a couple times during that period in order for us to receive further guidance from the state um, as to the health and safety protocols and the legislat legislative action that Superintendent Sibula talked about in regards to the days and clock hours. Um, on Friday, a final reminder was sent out to families asking that they respond to the survey by six o'clock Sunday evening. So as a result of all of that, we have received 1,916 responses from families to the survey. Um, again, those are family responses. So each one of them may have been two, three, four, even five kids in the district, which we love. Um, the results that we received overall were very similar to the preliminary survey we did in July, wherein uh, at the time we were estimating 25% of our students would be uh, going virtual. It turns out that overall it's about 24% right now with about 20% in grades 9 through 12 opting for the virtual option and about 26% of the students in grades K through 8 choosing the online option. So overall, a majority of our families are still requesting face-to-face -face instruction, but with that 24% uh, asking for virtual. 
The individual schools are working on balancing the numbers right now for each of the classes. And once this is done, we'll have a better idea as to what our average class size will be. We hope to have all of this finalized by the end of the week. So we're still working through the numbers, but wanted to give you a little update as to where we were in the higher level until we can get down into the numbers and actually start working on the individual classrooms. And then in order to provide for the health and safety of our students who have chosen the in-person instruction, we've taken a number of initiatives. One of those being our school nurse. She will be working twice as much as she was last year. So we were lucky to be able to have her become full-time this year. Our sub teachers will be assigned to individual buildings rather than working throughout the district or in other districts so that we can limit, limit their contacts and therefore protecting them and our students and our staff in the buildings. I'm sure Kirk will be talking about this later tonight, but EnviroClean will be adding to its staff for additional daytime cleaning hours in all of the buildings. Uh, we are increasing the hours of our lunch aids to help with the cleaning of the lunchrooms and cafeterias. Um, as far as PPE, uh, we have ordered and received face masks, both uh, disposable and clear transparent mask for both staff and students. We have a supply of the N95 mask available though for those who may get sick at school or for those cleaning those areas that require the N95 mask. We have gloves, we have surgical gowns if needed, we have face shields, uh, we have safety goggles. They've all been ordered and we all we have them available for use when we return to school. You know, they are being used now too, but they will be available for staff when we return to school on September 8th. Um, those will all be distributed out to the buildings within the next couple days so that everything is in stock and on hand when students return that first week of school. Um, and as far as any other staff updates, we are continuing to recruit for those positions and looking at how we can best service um, the students with those increased hours and trying to do our best to protect the health and safety of the students. Thank you, Don. Welcome. Um, Craig, I know you're busy, but um, could you please provide a quick update from the technology department? I will. So I did uh, get the stream going uh, earlier, long story short, there's a top secret YouTube key that I had to regenerate. So about the first person, Jeannie, that you were doing the written comments. So the stream's been working and I see a lot of people watching. So hello, everybody. Um, so just a couple things technology wise, you've You've heard me talk about this before. The biggest thing is devices. You know, how are we going to work through uh, getting devices in the hands of the kids? So right now, and you've heard me talk about this over the past few years through grants, through PTOs, through title grants, um, we've been able to, to purchase about 1,400 Chromebooks that are pretty much in every building. Um, and what we did in March when the governor said that we were not going to be doing face-to-face -face and they closed schools down is we collected all those Chromebooks from the buildings and then we created a quick program where parents could check out Chromebooks to take at home during that time. So that part is over. We collected all those Chromebooks and we're right in the process. We are going to take all those Chromebooks that were in the buildings and we're going to put them back in the buildings and those will be used for face-to-face -face learning. Um, when we put those carts back, one of the things that we're doing is we are going to mount permanently on the side of those, like a, a little cleaning station, what we call, it's a, it's a paper towel holder and also an automatic uh, dispensing unit for um, um, sanitary purposes. Um, okay, what's a big issue is Chromebooks and having enough Chromebooks. About three weeks ago, uh, I was able to be very fortunate and I found a vendor in New Jersey. Right now, all Chromebooks are back ordered. They're telling us till at least December. And I don't even know if that's going to be the case. Um, there is no Chromebooks to buy, but I found a vendor in New Jersey. Very fortunate, very thankful uh, that I was able to uh, buy a thousand Chromebooks about three weeks ago. So that is great news for our district. 
and we're in the process of setting those up now. So what are we going to do with those Chromebooks? Uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to provide a Chromebook to our staff members. We want to get them up to speed as quickly as possible. You've heard me talk before about the advantage of Chromebooks, the batteries that will last all day, built-in cameras. Uh, we're moving towards the Google platform. Um, so awesome news. These things are fantastic. We're going to get them in the hands of our staff members first, uh, our teachers first. Second thing is, uh, as that survey closed for, closed for those that are doing the virtual learning, this week, towards the end of this week, we're going to be sending out an email to all of those that chose virtual learning and again, explaining to them if they, if they are in need of a device, if they are in, in need of a Chromebook, we're going to have a, a mechanism in place, a form that they can fill out and request one. And then we will contact them, let them know dates and times of how they can pick those up. So that's good news too. Um, the other thing we did this summer, back when again, when schools closed, we took a few buildings, if you remember, and we put internet in the parking lot so people could use the internet uh, in the parking lot. Um, during that time, we found that, you know, as we're moving forward to online and virtual and need for internet, uh, we just completed the project of actually providing uh, public Wi-Fi internet in all of our school building parking lots and including here at the administrative building and central office. So all buildings will be outfitted for that. Um, last but not least, and I think this was kind of like when you're trying to find devices, uh, this was kind of a cool thing for us that came about. We found a company in New York uh, that is allowing us, uh, not allowing us, they have software that we can use to turn our 10 year old laptops into Chromebooks. It is the coolest thing. Uh, when you're looking for devices and in, in need of devices, um, and they are, minus, the, minus them being laptops, they act just like Chromebooks. So we're in the process of, we have over 200 devices, over the 200 of our old laptops that we can actually turn into Chromebooks, which we are doing put in the buildings. I, I just think that's the coolest thing as well. So we're, that's, that's our focus, trying to get devices in the, the hands of our students. So that's it. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate that and all the work that you do to keep us up and running. Um, the next update today, or uh, this, this evening, is going to be provided by Kirk Grizelka, our Director of, Director of Operations for East China School District. Kirk, are you there? I am. <clears throat> Good evening, Thanks. President Frank. Board members, um, I'm going to provide an update um, from the operations department. The uh, from the custodial um, update, due to the increased cleaning and disinfecting requirements, the districts made a decision to add one additional custodian to each site. Um, this position will be utilized by adding them to the day shift for disinfecting frequently touch points throughout the day. They will also be given a schedule of each teacher's um, prep hour so they can do additional disinfecting, including any classroom bathrooms um, that may exist. In addition to the normal, in addition to the normal evening cleaning, the large bathrooms will also be cleaned and disinfected during the middle of the day, and this meets the less than four hour requirement for those parts of the facility. As far as the summer deep cleaning, the majority of the work has been completed. We expect to have all classroom work completed by the end of this week. The last week will be used to finish up some common areas, including kitchens. Uh, I have scheduled times to walk through each building with the respective principals um, during this week to do audits. Um, one of the systems um, that we're putting in place in the classrooms um, is what we're calling buckets of wipes. Uh, to meet the requirement of wiping down desks between class changes, the district will be utilizing a system that distributes wipes from a bucket style dispenser. The liquid applied to these wipes is not harmful to the skin and it has a 60 second kill time. The supplier informed me today that they should be arriving later this week, which is actually really great news. Um, there's many other school districts, even in our county, that are using the exact same system, and there's a very high demand for them. So um, I was really excited and happy to hear that they're telling me that we're going to get all of these in um, by the end of the week. Um, and I've, 
I have additional um, supplies ordered also for refilling these. Um, and we're going to have um, some stations in the custodial areas where the teachers, when their bucket goes empty, they can bring it down there, drop the empty bucket off, and pick up the full one to take back to their classroom. So hopefully there won't be, I don't expect there to be any interruption in them being able to have these in their classrooms. Uh, the, the, one of the other efforts that we're doing is the plexiglass um, that some people are calling sneeze guards, and there's other terms, but all of the main offices in the school buildings are complete. Uh, we're continuing to install it across the district in counselor's offices and media centers and anywhere else that it's been requested. The transportation will also be, get, be completed before the school starts um, for the people in that building. Um, the next um, effort um, that the maintenance staff is undertaking right now is um, in line with the HVAC capability. Um, I looked into the capability of our school buildings to regulate the fresh air intake. The vast majority of our systems have the ability to be adjusted anywhere between 10% and 100% fresh air intake. The only limiting factor is going to be our ability to heat the air enough to maintain a temperature at the standard 69 degrees. Generally speaking, we can normally raise the temperature about 20 to 25 degrees from what is being brought into the coil. Um, that's what in our industry we call a delta. Um, <clears throat> with the average uh, September temperatures, we should be able to start out the school year with at least 50% fresh air intake. And we will monitor that and adjust that to maximize it as much as possible. This is over five times more than what our systems were normally set at. As we move into October and the nighttime temperatures dip down towards freezing, you know, of course we will have to be, we'll have to make some adjustments because of our ability to um, how much we can heat the air. <clears throat> Bathrooms and locker rooms, exhaust fans. This again is in line um, with um, fresh air exchange um, and screens uh, for windows. In an effort to make sure that bathrooms and locker rooms exhausts are working properly, I've hired Hammond's Mechanical Contracting, a company that we used before to help us complete some of the repairs and make sure um, all exhaust fans are working properly and repaired, so if not. I supplied the custodians at Marine City High School the other day with a 100-foot roll of screen material and some duct tape to try to um, help retrofit some of the windows that weren't designed to have screens to actually put screens on there. I'm being told after today that it's going um, pretty well. They've, they've already started installing them. And so that looks like it's gonna be a good solution um, to be able to add you know, more air exchange in the rooms um, as long as weather permits. So uh, that's a positive thing that we were able to modify and uh, work within the system and get that to happen. The last item on my list for an update tonight is hand sanitizer dispensers. Um, very, very fortunately, like Craig getting the Chromebooks that he did, we've been uh, fighting supply and demand trying to get automatic dispensers for the hand sanitizers for the last couple of months, um, to be honest. And I feel very fortunate that we finally got 300 of the automatic dispensers in last week. Um, I actually now feel like we have enough, an adequate amount to do the strategic placement throughout the schools. Um, this would place at least two per hallway, um, more likely probably three or four, two in the main offices, media centers, cafeterias, and a, and a larger amount even than that at each of the heavily used entrances. Um, I have, I'm still waiting on 200 gallons of, of some foaming product um, that I think um, will be best um, in the school situation because it seems to sit in the hand better. Um, but they are telling me that I should see those 200 gallons in the next week or so. In the meantime, I have 75 gallons um, of the also alcohol-based um, hand sanitizer arriving this, for, this Thursday. Uh, this will for surely get us going allow me to fill up all 300 dispensers as they are installed strategically throughout the district. 
And that uh, concludes my update. Thank you, Kirk, very much. I think it's worth noting that the East China School District um, Operations Department prior to the pandemic, prior to March 13th, when we were working on our bond, that was a, a department that we continually had to make adjustments with and sometimes some cuts in order to make, um, make our, our budget meet. And in the months since March 13th, this operations department and our custodial staff has become ever important in getting us back to school safely. And I want to thank Kirk and his department for um, coming online so quickly with what we need to do in such a different em environment than where we were in March. So thank you very much. Um, and finally, I want to point out in this update that all of the return to school committees have been meeting weekly and they now have on Friday, we posted the return to school safety plan for each school. So the governor signed the legislation on Thursday. We posted all of these plans on Friday. So you can click on each school and see um, how the key components of the return to school will operate in each one of those buildings. Their um, key components such as their arrival procedure, dismissal procedure, some of the cleaning that Kirk mentioned, how attendance will be handled, lockers and media center, et cetera. So if you're interested in individual buildings, all of those return to learn plans are posted on our website. And with that, I'll conclude our update on the return to learn plan um, for East China School District. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Saibula, Ms. Dimmick, um, Mr. Headley and Mr. Gazalka for your updates this evening. Um, at this time, we will move on to our action items. Our Can first we, action uh, item. Can we ask questions about any of those things that were just presented? Are we going to do that during the, the voting portion of the action meeting? Yeah, right. We usually do that when we open up um, the discussion after a motion's made. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our first action item is um, 6A, recommended action per administration recommendation. The Board of Education approves the contract extension agreement for the period of August 26, 2020 through December 31st, 2020 between the Board of Education of the East China School District and the East China Education Association. A motion is needed. So moved. Support. Pat, you have to un unmute yourself. Mike supported, though. Okay, so do we we get a, a motion and a support? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, same sign. I abstain. Okay. Mrs. Kronz, can you please note that for the record? Yes, I will note that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, the next item is um, recommended action. Per administration recommended recommendation, the Board of Education approves the school schedules as reviewed with the East China Education Association. A motion is needed. So moved. Pat is trying to support it. She Pat's to... supported. Pat's yeah. muted, so we'll do. Okay, so we have a, a, a motion and a support on that one? Yes. Okay, so now we'll open that up for any comments or questions, Todd. Thank you. Um, You're and I do, I want to throw, before I start asking those questions, I abstained from the action item about the extension of the East China Education Association contract as I normally do, um, as is appropriate. Um, and it's a good time to say that I've been accused a couple times of having a conflict of interest related to the return to school plan, which is, which is a totally different situation. Uh, a conflict of interest is when I would receive some kind of a benefit, like would happen in a, a contract with my wife being a teacher. The benefit, I guess, that I would gain from this plan is the health and safety of teachers and students 
and the quality of instruction. I mean, those are the things that are a part of this plan. So if that benefits me any differently than any other conversation and discussion that's been had throughout the six years of being on the board, I, I that's news to me. Um, that is every decision that we make. We had a bond issue where we decided to put secure entrances in our facilities to keep students safe and teachers safe. And it was never an issue that there was a conflict of interest there. So I just, I, I want to throw that out there because I feel like early on in this process, it was said, let's not make this political, but I feel like it's the most political thing that's happened in the six years that I've been on the board. And um, it's disappointing that it's been, it seems like an effort to, to not ask questions and not have open discussion. And, and that's been disruptive. I ask questions because I am concerned about the health and safety of staff and students and the quality of instruction. Uh, with that said, um, Kirk, um, the intake adjustments that you talked about, um, you said kind of weather dependent. Um, I don't know if there's a question or comment. You said it kind of depends because of the, the temperature. I would suggest that maybe we make some adjustments in what's acceptable temperature wise um, to make sure that those that intake is like the highest it can possibly be. Um, I mean, it, I think it'd be better to be hot or cold um, and dress appropriately and to have the absolute highest level of air intake that we can have to make sure that, uh, cause that's, I think that's more important right now. Um, just my, my comment there. Um, so I, I do have a question about the the schedule as far as the um, I know we have one, two, three, Monday, four, five, six, Tuesday with the collaboration time in the afternoon. I'm, I'm still not sure what what that looks like for a teacher teaching both the virtual and the in person at the same time and what what that means for a virtual student who's. And they seem like the odd person out in this mix. Can you describe maybe Suzanne a little bit what that looks like for a teacher teaching both at the same time and what that means for the online learner? Mrs. Sagnola, you're I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Um, yeah, so that that's what we were talking about when we were talking with the ECEA representatives that in order to do so again, I want to go back to what our driving goal was during this pandemic planning for our school district. And that was to connect our, stu our students with our teachers. There are other solutions um, that other districts have adopted, but we had decided that that was the most important thing for us to protect our electives at the secondary level and to protect those connections when we do eventually come back. So when we sat down last Thursday and, and then again on Friday and talked about how can we do this as a district and what do the teachers need, they um, conveyed that they need more time in order to make something um, um, happen for those virtual students in a quality manner. So that's why the, the schedule that we looked at on August 10th um, did, had a different release time. We've now built in more minutes so that the teachers have more time to connect with their virtual learners and develop those lesson plans. And on our website, we have a schedule um, of expectations for a virtual learner. So if you wanted to, to look, it says a secondary virtual schedule, and it outlines um, the, not by minutes, by expectation of what, what that student can be expected to do um, for their virtual learning. So it, look, it looks like um, it looks like the teacher would post a video of their lesson and then post the um, whatever handouts that they use in the in-person instruction, and those would just be available then to the virtual learner. Um, I'm not seeing any other like interactive tools, any, it, it looks like it's just kind of traditional thrown online without any, anything else. Is there, is there more to it than that? Yes, there's more to it than that. 
that's what those skills that our teachers are developing through the trainings that have been offered last week or two weeks ago last week and again this week is is helping with our teachers to develop the skills that they'll that are needed in order for them to develop the rich lesson plans that our online learners are going to be expecting and the legislation has um, given us guidance on the fact that we have to have a two-way weekly communication with those students um, and i believe in our guidelines here it says the teachers will connect with their virtual students through a live google meeting at least once per week um, part of the, um, the the balance with these virtual um, crisis learning plans is that um, some of our students need families need more flexibility they, they won't be able to log on at particular times of the day. We've even provided that flexibility at the elementary when we have our elementary virtual schedule. So teachers can, our students can be right um, synchronous learning, or if it works better for the family, there's an asynchronous component um, that they can um, tap into at the end of the workday for the parents. So we're trying to provide the flexibility for each family as we make our way through this very difficult crisis management uh, of a school um, return to learn in a pandemic. And the, the other, I guess, piece to that puzzle is the 90 minutes, um, which is another new experience for teachers to have that longer chunk of time. Um, and, and if that just is a traditional approach to instruction, then that's, I think, an, an issue too, because there's that should not be handled the same way. There's, um, from a instructional standpoint, can you speak to that? I sure can. Um, this 90 minute block, it, the, the increased minutes are there to accomplish some of the tasks that we'll need to accomplish during uh, this 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 time when we have to modify a schedule for the for the virus. It's not increasing the time in order to change our pedagogy. Uh, when I was a teacher, we went from a 660 to a 90 minute block. And, and, and there was a reason for doing that that involved teaching and learning. The increased minutes here will give our teachers more contact time with their students, which will help with the, with the learning. But it also gives us time to do those tasks that the, that the um, requirements and protocols put in place for us. So we're going to have to and we want to provide, you know, mask breaks for our students. We're going to stagger how the restroom is used so that it isn't that we don't have um, congregation at the restroom entrances and that some of that time might be used for that uh, we're going to address social emotional needs of students and so this time um, although 90 minutes when you're a teacher it, it does seem like a lot of minutes when you're going from 60 to 90 but it, these minutes are to help us complete tasks that we would not normally need to complete it's not moving to a black schedule in order to change the pedagogy of our teaching and learning. So because of the additional demands of that time, the social emotional, the staggered bathroom, the different things, um, we're really kind of losing instructional time. It's gonna, it's gonna change the amount of time available to teachers to teach the, the curriculum, right? Because you're only seeing hours one, two, three in a given day and you're really, it sounds like accomplishing the same amount within a 55 minute class period. So now you really have half the time that you would have normally. So what, what are we doing pacing wise? Well, I wouldn't make it as simple as half, uh, half the time. The, the time is there to complete the task. But again, we have extended time more than that 55 minutes for teachers to be with those classes during those days. And that, that, crisis, we're in crisis um, management position right now where we're, we're trying to provide the optimum learning in a very difficult situation. And in reference to the pacing, um, we have, we have um, conveyed with each of our groups, each of our return to learn committees, that our pacing guides are going to need to have some adjustments to them as we work through um, this time at which we're offering, you know, the two different options for our families. Now, I hope, and it's our dream in East China School District, that when we're back and, and, and we're in a regular learning um, environment, that we can, um, you know, get back to using our pacing guides in, in, in the manner that we were developing them. But at this time, we're going to have to make some adjustments in order to realistically meet the needs of our students.
the um one other area that i wanted to ask about was the the first four days the half days uh -huh. I'm glad that we're working in a, a practice. I think that's a good idea um, to do that. We, I mean, we still don't know one week before, we won't, we'll only have one week before school starts to know how many kids are in a classroom. Um, and that does still concern me. That's a question we've been asking all along. And I understand we have to give people a chance to make their decision. But one week before school starts is all we'll have to know how many are in a classroom. And it looks like just looking at the numbers, 20% uh, of kids are going to be online in nine through 12 and 26 and K through eight. So we're still, we're not social distancing at a very high level. It's, it's uh, if you can fit 20 desks, three feet apart in an elementary school classroom, we're, we're going to have more than that. It's there's not going to be a lot of social distancing. And that means our common areas, especially at high school with 800 kids and 80% of the kids are going to be in school. That's not a lot of social distancing. Um, is there any thought about, I know, I know, I know everybody wants their choice and, and let's just one way or the other, but to bring half the students in for a week, for two weeks to test the, test the options with fewer kids and then bring everybody in because we again we still are bringing everybody all at once on day one right i i, I understand um what you're saying and, and and have continued to say but we don't know until we start balancing these numbers and seeing which students return exactly what we're looking at and that's what the conversations we had with our ecea representatives to please Give us time to look at the numbers, see who returns that first week of school, balance the classes. It isn't, especially at the secondary level, it isn't a, a straight 20% across the board coming out of each class. There's, we have all those electives that drive the schedule that will cause different class sizes. So we need to look at you know, the AP class numbers and, and some other classes that, that have either lower or higher numbers in them to kind of balance, to balance that out. And I think that if we can um, test our, do this soft opening on those half days and test our system, see who is returning to school with us and make plans safely for them, that I think that then we can move forward. If we find, and I've said this every time, if we find that our numbers can't be balanced the way that we want them, we will look at the next option. But I feel strongly that it's important not to jump there until we at least go through the process to see where we are at. Um, we know that our teachers and our students being together um, is, is critically important. We've heard it from our community. And I, I, I would like to at least see before we move um, to making decisions based on numbers, what those numbers um, end up being and also on that first week with half days we won't have uh, the lunch um, aspect to, to deal with so that will really give us um, a time to create those seating charts and know exactly who's going to be there for those lunch periods and be able to, to take care of those seating charts so um, I, I, I understand your concern it, it, it's a concern um, for everyone but that's I think we need to follow the steps to get us to the best end result. But but Suzanne, I think that, you know, I think the plan that everybody's put together has been quite good. The only thing I would say is that the implementation of the plan is the most critical. Agreed. And I think that when you enter in with the maximum number of students, it's also the maximum amount of chaos. And, you know, you really have two days to get this right. You know, if, if, somebody is infected with the virus on the first two days uh -huh. i mean really the plan won't work so oh, I would, I don't. I, I, no i mean in terms of spreading a virus i would just encourage a little more thought about the first few days and the reduced number of uh -huh. kids around through the process otherwise I, I think the plan is is good so if the number I'm sorry, some, if the numbers um, that we have at the end of this week allow us you know, to feel safe in, in bringing those students back and um, testing our, our procedures and protocols, I, I still stand by the fact that I think that's 
that's the best option. But again, as a school board, if you would like to, um, you know, direct a different um, approach, uh, I will obviously listen and work within that. Suzanne? Yes. I guess my, my question is one of, of timing. So the survey is closed now. Um, so now when you're looking at numbers, you're, you're, you already know how many students, but what you're saying is you need to see how they all fit within the framework of a day. Mm -hmm. I mean, should we not be able to kind of look at that data before we approve an educational instruction schedule? What do we have time for that? Yeah, I mean, if if you would like to reconvene after we have the numbers, uh, you know, at that I will leave up to to the school board. But it we will have those by the end of by the end of this week, um, so that we can uh, look at what what the balance of the classrooms, the size of the classes will be. I I do think like. Mike was saying that uh, I think we would benefit from from bringing in half the students, even if it's the first week or the first two weeks, to to have the a chance to really because if we get it wrong, everyone's choice of coming back full time, and if we get it wrong, we're not going to have the choice anymore, because if we get corn a, a large number of of cases, we get quarantined, all those kinds of things. I just I want to do it right if we're going well, to do it. There is nobody that wants to do this more right <laughs> than me. But you have to keep in mind, even though we have students returning, all of those safety protocols are in place. All of the cleaning, all students now are wearing masks. All It isn't as if they're coming into a situation that we don't have procedures and protocols and safety measures put in place. They're coming back to a very structured environment. And if you review those return to learn plans for each school, you'll see that there's different doors that students will be entering and different doors that they'll be dismissing from. And there's different plans for how they're going to be dismissed for bathroom breaks or using the hallways. So I understand that it is um, um, important to know what those class size numbers are going to be. But I also know that all of these measures are in place um, when these students re return, which the governor has told us if we put these in place, we can return to face-to-face -face learning. So I, I'm struggling with, um, you know, with why we wouldn't, at least with all the protocols and safety measures in place, you know, try those half days um, for the first four days. But again, you know, this is, it's a it's a fluid situation, and I am open to you know making any adjustments that the board um, gives me direction on. Suzanne, I have a question. If we approve this plan this evening, and after the first four days, we find we have um, any kind of hiccups, what is what's our step after that? And what what plan do you have in place um, for if that should happen? Well, the plan that we have is for each of the staffs to meet after each one of those half days to, you know, to troubleshoot and look at what systems work, what didn't, what adjustments need to be made. Um, but at a broader perspective, at the board level, we are to, um, based on the legislation, we have to bring our plans back every 30 days for review. Right. So that's already built into the legislation to relook at your health data for your communities and have the plan reviewed yeah, every 30 days. So, um, but if 30 days was, you know, too far out from where we are, and this is our regularly scheduled board meeting. So that's why, you know, we're, we're here where we are right now. If, if, if you want to do something different, then we, we certainly can, can do that as well. I'm just concerned that the, uh, the students might not have in-depth knowledge of all the protocols that you're talking about. And they're really the ones that are going to dictate how how this. Yeah. Can you speak to that, Suzanne? I I I know. Um, I thought I forwarded something out to the board about um, the individual buildings plans and uh -huh. communication with the students. 
Yeah, so the communication to the students, and you're right, they're critical pieces of, of this puzzle, is um, there are orientations for both fifth grades at each end. There's Mariner Day that is this week on the 26th. There is Saints Day on the 1st. There are welcome back letters that are going out from each of the school buildings to the students from the principals about you know what, what will be happening in their buildings. So the communicate, just like it is, um, and every school year, but with enhanced measures this year, the communications to students, and, and some of these students didn't get that, um, you know, when they're moving to a different building or uh, like fifth grade going to St. Clair Middle or ninth grade moving up, they didn't get their end of the year visits. And so those are happening now. I know St. Clair Middle Schools is this week. Um, and then in, the, in those return to school welcome backs, they're talking about mask wearing and, and what the procedures will be in the school buildings. Do we have any other comments or questions? Yes. Yeah. Oh, there I go. Okay. Um, I kind of like that idea. First of all, I appreciate the half days. But if our first week is basically teaching people protocol, then to have half the kids each day, your you know first one two three, and then the next day one two three, and then the second you know Thursday and Friday four five and six, teaching them protocol in smaller groups might not be a bad idea to make sure that everybody understands exactly what's expected of them. I, I had never thought of anything like that, but that's. Is that something that can be taken care of prior to the start of the school year? As far as protocols? I guess. Yeah, they're, um, they're all, that's what, that, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. As far that, as educating the students on the protocols and the guidelines for each building. Yeah, those are happening in those, you know, welcome back letters in the, um, the orientations that are happening. And the principals, um, we have a principal meeting tomorrow. We're going to be discussing creating videos so that this, they can walk their students through and show them the changes or the procedures that are new to this school year with our um, return to learn um, pandemic planning. All of those things will help students to feel more comfortable returning um, to the school buildings and know what's expected of them when they return. I, I okay. just looking at. Um, I'm sorry, Jeannie. Go ahead. No, that's okay. I was just going to have her clarify. So each building ha is putting together a video instructing students on what to expect when they come back, where the sanitizing stations are, the masks, the entrances. I know Saint Clair Middle School has a different entrance for each grade level. All of that's going to be taught to the students before the first day of school. Yes. Yes. Okay. I think that maybe clears up um, a couple of questions. Uh, who will be teaching on protocol before a school? I'm sorry. No, the principals. The poor I'm principals. Sorry. If you're listening, principals, this is what we're talking at the meeting tomorrow about. <laughs> um, they're going to be creating videos. They've got their signage for the building. I think most all of the buildings have their signage up. And so now that that's up, I want them to walk around with, you know, and introduce the different procedures and protocols and, and what will be happening, what doors they'll be entering um, when they return to school. And so that's what um, the, the principal meeting will be about tomorrow is how they're going to develop those, those ways to communicate with the students before they arrive. I will say as a principal, I, I want to believe that I have a lot of power and influence over my students, but I do think that the classroom teachers in a smaller setting will be more effective in, in teaching and, and discussing the protocols um, and, and really driving them home than the before school messages um, from a principal. Um, I just think, I mean, you look around us and, and the number of schools going online and, and there's a reason for that. And the, there's a lot of questions that we keep asking over and over again. And there's a reason for that because this is difficult. Um, you know, I, to consider the possibility of even for the first week, bringing in half the kids at a time to just try to be a little more careful, a little patient going in so that the next week can be more effective. I, I would support that if 
the rest of the board is uh, behind that kind of an idea. I, I support the students going back. That is, I mean, we've heard from all our parents and they want to be able to have the choice. And if it's three hours and three hours, it's a matter of six hours to set the pace, set the protocols, make sure everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. I, I don't think that's too bad of an idea. So are you saying with, with, all the students present or are you saying to do the first week with half the students present i i i thought that's what you were talking about I was thinking, what, would that, what would that look like if you were to I'm, i mean i know the hard work i you know i know i hate to ask that but um what what do you do you find that there would be benefits to that do you where, where do you stand on that idea? I guess I'd have to process with my team what what that would look like. Um, I, I, I'm sure our families would have um, some input as to, you know, what might be a challenge for them. Um, but uh, again, we, we I mean, I, I we'd, I'd have to pull my team together and, and talk about what that would look like and how you choose you know, which half are returning and and when they're returning and are they, you know, in the same family? And I guess I would need clarification. Are you talking K-12? I see. I mean, I, I, I would say, yeah. It gives, it just. Pat, Pat, you're up. Craig, can you take Pat off of mute, please? Hang on, Pat. You're on mute. We're trying to unmute you. I cannot. She has to. Pat, unmute your microphone. Take the cursor down to the bottom. I can mute, but there I can There, go. there yeah. we go. Good when job. When people are done, I just have some thoughts on that, too, but I don't want to interrupt anybody. No, go ahead. Did, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, go ahead. I, I understand where Todd and Karen are coming on these half days, but as a former um, uh, uh, teacher whose classes were mixed nine through 12, I would find that very frustrating to have half my kids come in. Let's say, let's say you have ninth and 10th grade on Tuesday and Wednesday and 11th and 12th grade um, on Thursday, Friday. To me as an um, elective class, that would be, not real productive. Um, well, you're not you're not diving into your curriculum on day one. You're teaching oh, them sure safety you are, protocols. Right? <laughs> you're teaching them safety protocols and getting to know them a little bit. It's, you know. <laughs> and I I just think with Mariner Day and Saints Day and and I know um you know well I used to know anyway I've been out for this is my ninth year that I I think by them walking through that that day and like you said fifth grade will have their orientation i'm sure kindergarten will have something going on and with everything out there on the website um i i i don't know i i just think if we're gonna and and about 20 percent we're not gonna have anyway in these buildings approximately give or take so i don't know i you know, we've got to step in sometime. We've got to do it. And I just think it would be less. I'm trying to think of parents. I'm trying to think of kids. I just think it would be, let, let's just do September 8th and just just do it. That's my thoughts. But I will do, I'm a team player. I will do what anybody else wants. So if we did four half days and kids only came to two of them instead of all four of them, so we'd be asking parents to make an adjustment for two additional days, um, what they've been doing for five months, um, in order to maybe possibly, hopefully be safer, just practice our, I mean, gee, I, I just feel like we can give away a, a week of, you know, hybrid to be a little safer than just plow in and and then man oh everybody here comes you know here comes 600 kids up from the pit 
uh, they have between, you know, they have 11 minutes to get to class and it's just all of a sudden here they all are. And I, I like that we have time for teachers and administrators to meet afterwards and debrief. But um, in the meantime, they just went through a half a day of, like Mike said, kind of chaos. Can, if you, you can control it for the first week with half the kids and then the next week have everybody there, it's uh, to me, it's a pretty small uh a pretty small sacrifice to get to get back to normal as we as we say so todd you're saying then that so the first week tuesday and wednesday half the kids come thursday friday the other half come and then come monday we're on our normal new schedule is that what you're that's what you just said i believe is that correct yeah, that's what I'm offering as a suggestion. Whether whether it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, oh, Thursday, right. or every other, or however, however you know, right. and her team decided to do it. Um, Suzanne, how how big of a monkey wrench would that throw into everything? Um, how about we do this? Uh, we have a motion on the table to approve these the the schedule as presented. If another motion wants to, you want to make another motion. Um, to not come back. Um, well, why don't we just adjust the? Um, we could just adjust the motion. Do that. I think that would be easier than throwing more motions around. Um, but, but my question to you was, how how big of a monkey wrench would that be? Would, is that something that you and your team can accommodate on this sort of notice? My yeah, my my team and I can do anything um, that needs to get done. Um, I, I, I think that we're ready to go as presented. Um, but yes, we can, we will be able to get what needs to get done, um, for half students. And if, if you're saying K through 12, again, that's a bigger challenge, um, with elementary aged students. Well, I don't know. Is it really necessary K through 12? I mean, the K through five kids, they're kind of, they kind of just follow the teacher around where they're. I mean, I, I'm not a teacher, but I mean, I, I think to me, I would think it would be more at a secondary level where the students are on their own and and they're not being directed by the adults. I mean, the elementary school classes will be full. I mean, they'll be very full. And so just figuring <laughs> out how to space your, your I don't see what it, what it hurts for everybody for, I mean, we're talking four days, four half days to just try to work with half your kids for a couple days to put your position in place. If, if I'm understanding Todd correctly, he's saying have half the kids come, not juniors and seniors, but like A through M, M through Z, so that you have your class, but only half the kids there. So you have half the kids to teach them what to do. Is that what I'm to understand? Todd, is that what you're thinking? Comfortable. That's what I'm thinking. You, so, you you have half the kids in every class, half the kids in the hallway, half the kids in the parking lot, um, in before and after. So I, it wouldn't be you wouldn't want to eliminate a, a ninth grade class because you eliminate all the kids of that biology class. You want half of the kids of that biology class coming on one day and the other half coming the next day. Is that what I'm? Is that? Am I understanding this correctly? It's just all kit. He's talking about all, all, all students. Well, that half of them are so, there and half of them aren't. Yeah, Todd and Todd will know this as a high school principal. You'd have to go through each class and decide. Otherwise, you're going to have some classes that are full on those half days and some that won't have any students in them on those on those days and I'm talking about if you bring half the students back if you did it by alphabet or if you did it by grade level it's not going to evenly evenly distribute half the students in those classes so that's where if, if that's the goal if we're trying to test our systems um, you know that's why the half days were discussed when we were in those meetings that we thought that would be our test but you would have to, I'll reiterate, you'd have to go through every class and take half of them out in order to- That, that would only be if you if you were dead set on, we gotta have a clean 50% in every class. And I mean, I think you could do it and say this class, well, this class happened to be 
really full um, in this class, not as much, but I mean, at least you're still, you're still taking the total number and cutting it down for a couple days to, because the big areas of concern are going to be the hallways, the passing times, the, the arrival, dismissal. That's where the big groups are going to be together. And that's half the kids. But no matter what. Those are, that's just my, my feelings is a minute. It's a pretty minimal um, thing to do to try to be safe. Ahead. I'm sorry to keep interrupting. Keeping in mind, those are the procedures that those return to school committees have been looking at. So that arrival and dismissals, they've got students coming in different doorways. So it isn't that everyone's going to come up. We're, we're, we're staggering um, dismissals. We've got hallways moving in one direction. All of those safety protocols are being put in place. And the half day was just an additional safety measure so that we could really test to see if our systems were working for those four days, giving our staffs time to brain, um, collaborate and brainstorm after each day to see, okay, this worked, this didn't work, we need to tighten this up or, you know, that's when we were talking with the ECEA, that's why those half days became um, uh, uh, important so that we could test the system. So basically the, okay, so I'm sorry, Mrs. Bebop, Pat is still, is muted. Pat, you're muted again. Okay, my comment was, so the ECEA is agreed with these four mm -hmm. half days. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And let me just say, I, I'm always saying that they are, that we're waiting to see what our numbers flush out, but that, yes, okay. that was an agreement. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I, I kind of feel like, um, I know we're all very passionate about this and and we want to make sure we get it right but also as board members we kind of have to stand back and 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 look at what our goal is and we obviously always want to put our kids first our families first but we also have to trust our administration and our staff to follow the cdc guidelines follow the the regulations that the governor has given us to go by in order to return to in-person um, instruction and just trust that those protocols and safety measures are put into place as I think her plan has um, proven and with Mr. Gazalka's um, presentation this evening, I, I kind of feel like we just have to trust um, our, our staff and our administration and if we, if they take those first four half days and they see that there's going to be any problems they're gonna they're gonna stop and adjust at that time is that correct that's correct so what what could that possibly look like would it be would there would there be a situation on friday when you say when you say you know we we can't come back like this next week we need to do something different i mean that's a pretty quick turnaround you mean to change the schedule for the following week? I think that, that it wouldn't just be on Friday. We'd start it on Tuesday. So you're meeting each day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and talking about you know each of the days, what we're finding is our areas that were being successful and the areas that we needed to um, you know make some improvements or adjustments, you know. So I I think we wouldn't be waiting, you know, until Friday to make those decisions. Those would be talked about continuously throughout that week. If you found things that I guess the point was, if you found if you found something that was like really, really challenging, that would cause you to have to rethink the plan of having 80 percent of our kids in school. Um, you take that kind of adjustment from that first week into the next week. Well, surprisingly, um, every day is, is adjustments. Every day. I mean, every time we sit down and look at this schedule, every time we have a return to school committee meeting, that's why if you'll, you'll notice any of the documentation from our district or any district, it's all usually it says draft or in working form because it's, it's a continual adjustment. Um, these, are, these are all new situations for all of us, but I keep relying on the fact that our governor put together a team for return to school and, and, and gave us the protocols that we have to put in place. And we've done that, not only just the required protocols, but the 
uh, strongly recommended and recommended protocols to bring us back. I mean, just recently, if, if you're um, wondering about our, our turnaround time, we got new information regarding masks. You know, we had shared that, that masks would be worn differently at the elementary level and the secondary level. Well, when you're presented with new information and new guidance from the governor's office, you have to make a change. And that's what we did. We will continue to do that and continue to re rely on the experts to guide us through this situation until we're on the other side. I think the issue is, is that protocols are only as good as the people that follow them. And that's where the concern is. You know, when people first come back to school, that that's when you're, they're most likely not to follow those protocols. And I guess I would just I would just comment that um, I think what I, I I guess I'll just speak for myself personally have heard overwhelmingly from our community is choice. They want choice, and so to to take four days to to bring people back slowly so that the choice isn't taken away. Um, I, I think there's some value in that. And I hope you don't think it's a, a question of administration or anything like that. I've read every one of the plans. I spent all afternoon today going through every single plan and they're amazing. And you know what the plan is and now I know what the plan is. But I got to tell you, there's going to be a lot of students who don't know what their role is until they're told what to do. Uh, the The plans are amazing. You know, I they covered things that I hadn't even thought of. But students don't know what to do until they're told what to do. If, like I said earlier, I've got an amazing team, um, smart, talented can make good decisions. If the board wants to direct us in, in a different direction than the one presented, we will happily do that. I think a one week adjustment is a pretty minimal um, change to make to give us a added level of protection, safety. Um, that, would, that would be where I'd wanna go. Okay, so then we we're looking at potentially changing our motion um, to also include um, with half the student population returning at 50% capacity split over the first four days. Now, please let me interject here for a moment. We aren't going to be able to split classes evenly. So knowing that you might have a full class and a teacher with two students in it that is so the only systems you're you're really testing in my opinion is arrival and dismissal but if 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 you're okay knowing that a split in the in the in the um, students you know half and half is not going to give you half in one class and half in another i just want to make that very clear that no matter how we do this, that's not, you know, whether it's by alphabet or by family or grade level, you're going to have some teachers that are going to have full classes and some that, that will not during this time. And so, um, and I need to make sure that I'm understanding your direction correctly in that you're, you're saying K through 12. Do you see any benefit in doing this, um, Suzanne? I think that um, I, I'm hearing a strong feeling from the board that, 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 you know, that this would make them feel more comfortable with it. But I've been working in these plans from March. And so I feel very comfortable that we have a good solution for the start of our school year. So um, I understand that maybe if you haven't been in the day-to-day -day planning of this, how it might feel differently. I, I, I do understand that. Uh, but um, I do think that if we're going to make a change um, today with with this with this um, board decision, that I, I just please give me the 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 specific direction in which you want um, the change to head. Because this is something new that we're just processing. You'd want it, it in my opinion. You'd want K twelve, but 
for the elementary, since they're only going to be in one class, I believe we would only have to do it on the Tuesday and Wednesday, half on Tuesday, half on Wednesday, and then and then they could continue on because they would learn the protocol each the first day. Whereas at secondary, if on Tuesday you had half the kids come one, two, three, and the other kids come Wednesday, one, two, three, and then Thursday, four, five, six, and the other half, four, five, six, they would learn the protocol in every one of their classes because it's gonna be different in a science room as in, an, you know, it's gonna be different in an English room. But with the elementary, I'm kind of thinking you'd only have to do it the first two days. And in my years of teaching, I've never had a class where I only have A through M in the class. You know, you always have, maybe you have more of the alphabet, but never all of the alphabet, all the half. So I think you'd, you would, but I think for elementary, it would only have to be the first two days. So Tuesday, Wednesday? Tuesday, Wednesday, because you would have half your class on Tuesday, but they would, but elementary are with their teacher all day. They're not with six different teachers. I, I don't know what. So I just want to make sure it, I'm, I'm hearing you. So the elementary would be half would be going on Tuesday and half would be going on Wednesday, but the full student body will be returning on Thursday and Friday? I, I, I think that would work. I don't know. Lynn, Todd, Mike, Jeannie, what do you think? And is Amy on? I don't believe Amy's here this evening. I guess that question, and that would be maybe for, for Suzanne and the team, is for, I don't know how that would work for you guys for transportation and you know what I mean? If you're splitting the district up and doing it kind of two different ways, um, if that would be harder for you to do it that way. Um, well, the elementary runs are separate from the secondary runs, so that wouldn't cause an issue at the transportation level. The issue is going to be um, just the communication to, to the families um, that, you know, that this is this is a change and that um, we're, we're trying to see we're trying to test our systems with 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 the returning face-to-face -face students, and so, um, like I said, uh, I, I think that the the elementary probably would only need the two days to do the half and half, and then Thursday and Friday they'd have their full student body back, um, and then secondary, we would have to look at what that split would look like. What, what how are you going to divide out the, 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 the days, the hours? Is it by, you know, hour or alphabet or how's that gonna look? And then that will impact our transportation department um, as far as who's getting picked up on those days um, according to however we, we do the division. I mean, just a suggestion, but you know, if you just uh, averaged out the uh, students in the classrooms just to get uh, the experience of how you know, the half class, half number of people would flow. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be everybody, you know, two kids in the class that they're going to be in. Uh, Don Demick, is there anything that you want to add to this? You've been integral in the uh, planning. Well, my only concern, I don't know if concern is the right word, but the idea for these half days was for us to be able, as Suzanne said, to test what we do have in place and what we're recommending. My concern is if we go to half the kids on half days, those kids, some will not come. So we still won't know how many kids we actually are going to have in a classroom. If we do a half day system, no matter how we do it, even alphabetically, different family members have different last names. So you're, if their older child's not going to school that day, their younger child may not go to school that day. And so I think the reason we were thinking of the half days is so that we could test these processes without having a full day and then being able to review. And with transportation, we're still gonna have to run our full transportation routes on all four days because we they're still living throughout the district. So transportation is still gonna go as it is. Um, there won't be any difference there, but yet again, 
transportation won't know who's actually riding the bus because they won't know which half isn't coming to school that day. So a lot of the reasons why we put these in place, it won't it won't achieve necessarily what we were hoping for it to achieve because then we'll be starting on Monday with a full day with lunches and everything else. Whereas the idea for the half days was to see how many students we had, how we could manage lunch and be ready for that for the following week. But I mean, like Suzanne said, we can certainly make anything work. And if, I mean, I understand that it will help with the education of the um, hand washing, the hygiene and the protocols and getting kids used to that but I'm just concerned it may not achieve what we were hoping it would achieve with getting those and testing our processes and procedures for that first week prior to full day, everyone being there on Monday. But we are up to the challenge of anything, so we can do it. Well, would a compromise be all for the whole district, A through M go on Tuesday, Elementary works out, we figured that, but secondary, they would learn procedures from ours, you know, A through M would learn procedures from first, second, and third hour teachers. And then N through Z come on Wednesday and they learn all the procedures from their fourth, fifth, and sixth teacher. And then we do the half full half days Thursday and Friday and it's kind of a compromise that we kind of enter slowly but then you get to see exactly how many kids are going to show up and so if a kid doesn't come for one day they're only missing one day in three hours actually. Now, I will I will say at the at the secondary level I mean the way you've got the schedule set up anyways I mean they're done at 12 36 every day um, and you have an hour and 20 minutes um, at the end of every day. So you can, even the second week of school, if you split them up and do the, do the half and half for the first week, and then the second week, you're still testing now the full system, and you still have um, an opportunity in the afternoon to debrief just based on the way you, you no, those, schedule. Remind, reminder, those minutes were um, discussed with the ECEA to be used to connect with their students and to lesson plan and collaborate. That's why those minutes are there at the end of the day. It wouldn't be used for a staff meeting or a, 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 to getting together. That's, again, we keep going back to, and um, Dawn made a great point that some of our families may just choose to wait until the Monday when we go back, um, you know, full time. And now we didn't get a chance to test who's really going to be there um, during those half days. That, that was the whole purpose of the half days was to, to really test our systems and see how um, our safety protocols were working and then provide the opportunity for staff members afterwards to get together and debrief and make adjustments as necessary. Well, after hearing from Dawn and more information from you and the ECA and administration has worked on this, I think we need to stick with what you presented to us. I, 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 I'm sitting here listening and I don't think we're giving the high school kids a lot of credit as far as them being able to catch on and learn the protocol. I mean, they're ready to go. They want to come back. They're going to listen and, and they're going to know it. I, I just, you know, we're going to have to dive in sooner or later, guys. And, and I, I think that you guys have put in a lot or, or tried to, there's always going to be something that we are not going to be able to foresee. So I like the four half days because we're easing into it. You know, they meet, they only go for like three hours and 40 minutes. I think we need just to stick with the plan. I, I mean, after hearing what, what Dawn and Suzanne has said, and I, you know, you've worked with the ECEA and they're all in favor of this too. So now we're going, well, you know. Well, no, I agree. And that, that goes back to what I said. We, we have to remember as board members, um, as, as much in, in, as we all care, we want to be a part of this. We want to do what's right. It's a scary time. It's a big decision. We don't want to get it wrong, but we do have to trust our administrators. We have to trust the hard work that they put into the plans. And we have to just, um, we have to take the step. 
I, I think the, the first four half days were really a brilliant solution to what is the unknown. And I think that we need to go with, um, you know, the plan that's been presented. We've already voted on the main plan. Our community is looking forward to us getting through this this evening so that they know where, what they're going to be doing. And I, I feel like if we're going to make more changes and that's going to affect their schedules, I, I just think we need to trust our, our administration, our staff, and um, go forward with the plan as presented. So we do have a motion on the table. Um, so are we good to go for a vote? I, I still feel like we should we should still I, I, I still feel strongly about the half the, the half the people idea. Um, so that, that's where I am. I, I don't know we'll make a motion on that and see where the board is as a whole and then move forward with the. Let's move forward with the motion on the table. So the motion on the table is a recommended action for administration's recommendation. The Board of Education approves the school schedules as reviewed with the East China Education Association. So we've, we've discussed it. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Oh, wait, 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 wait. wait. We'll do a roll call in a moment. Is that um, where you're just? So what I'm wondering, if I vote yes now, it's as it stands. If I vote no, then we go to a second motion for the half days. It, it, am I correct? Then they're going to go back. Then the, they're going to have to go back to the drawing board and come up with something different because we can't spend all night here this evening trying to come up with the back to school return plan. That's not really our job as school board members. That's the administration's job. So if if it doesn't get approved, then then the, the, the school district will have to come back with another plan. Jenny, can you reread the motion as it stands on the table now? Of course. Per administration recommendation, the Board of Education approves the school schedule as reviewed with the East China Education Association. The school to return plan was already voted on at our last meeting. This is just the schedule that we're voting on this evening. So all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Aye. Okay, Mrs. Kronz, can you please do a roll call? Vice President Bebuck? Yes. Trustee Karen Cedar? No. Secretary Lynn Grefor? Yes. Trustee Mike Westrick? No. Trustee Todd Disarath? No. Okay. President Jeannie Frank? Yes. Okay. So we have a split, three and three. Which means it fails, is that correct? Yes. Well, I don't think we can go back and do another motion. What we're saying is we don't approve the plan uh -huh. and correct. the administrators are, have to come, are gonna have to come up with another plan. And it sounds like we're gonna have to have a special board meeting probably next yeah. Monday before school starts. Is that, I'm, I'm just that's asking. Correct. Well, that's correct. That's oh. correct. The board was only three people. We asked them Okay, so um, at that time, at this time, the next item on our agenda is, well, items for our next regular board member, be, excuse me, our next regular board meeting, which is our annual, annual bullying report. Um, and then we will be setting a time and a date for the next special board meeting. So with that, we're adjourned.